Thank you. Uh, as you have no doubt aware, this is the third of a three-part uh, presentation on type 2 diabetes. And in this particular section, I'm talking about insulin and how you can use insulin in the process of the treatment of type 2 diabetes. Uh, the objectives here is to discuss the physiology of insulin secretion, to apply these physiologic principles in the selection of available insulin preparations to treat the specific defects contributing to hyperglycemia, and discuss the possible advantages of some insulin preparations over others. So how is insulin normally secreted? Well, all of us produce a little burst of insulin every nine minutes. And so that's how we secrete insulin. And so there's a constant background level of insulin. When we eat, the amplitude of the pulse and the frequency of the pulse increases, thereby giving us a prandial increase in the, uh, in the, in the meal-associated insulin accretion. So that's how we normally secrete insulin. If you therefore take that physiology and you say you're going to treat someone, then those nine-minute pulses would be your basal insulin. You want it to be basically flat, and that's what the good Lord does. It produces nine minutes flat. It basically regulates how much glucose comes out of the liver. When insulin is there, it is able to suppress glucagon, and that combination allows you to regulate how much glucose comes out of the liver. It has a very limited ability to actually take glucose from the blood and put it into the muscle. If it had a tremendous ability to do so, all of us would be hypoglycemic at night. So therefore, that insulin is only geared to regulate hepatic glucose output. So when you think about therapeutics, that's what you should be thinking about in terms of the insulin. Can you use this insulin to control hepatic glucose output without causing glucose disposal in muscle? Prandial insulin, the insulin you produce with meals, now that is a completely different effect. It is produced in response to the glucose. The rapid rise, that first phase, is crucial to shut off the glucagon and thereby completely shut off hepatic glucose production. The duration must be limited to the extent of the meal. You cannot have it functioning afterwards, otherwise you get hypoglycemia. And in fact, that prandial insulin is how you partition how much of this meal you're going to oxidize for energy and how much you're going to store for later use. So this is how you think about the insulin. So in this particular uh, sketch, you see here the basal insulin in purple, the prandial insulin in, in, in green, and basically if you change the basal insulin, you can get differences in how insulin functions. And therefore, you can get into a huge amount of problems in terms of hypoglycemia. The first phase of insulin secretion, the rapid rise in insulin as soon as you start to eat, is important because it ensures the prompt inhibition of hepatic glucose output and a rapid disposal of a significant part of the meal into oxidative processes rather than into storage processes. And thereby, you limit the postprandial glucose excursion. Now, we've had a lot of studies showing us, oh, well, glucose may not play a role in vascular disease. But when you look at endothelial function in response to insulin, what you see here is amazing. In the yellow are normal glucose tolerance. In the uh, orange is impaired glucose tolerance. In the blue, it's diabetes. Look at the flow-mediated brachial artery dilatation. In response to a meal, fasting, you already impaired in, if you have diabetes. But notice the significant impairment in dilatation during, after the meal. That's what happens when you have a high postprandial rise. And the, uh, the T-bars just explain this in a different way. T-bars are a measure of, uh, of the loss of, uh, 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 of endothelial function. When you look at what happens in people who have diabetes, there's a progressive deterioration. And it's almost always the postprandial glucose precedes the deterioration in fasting sugar. So if you look at people with hemoglobin A1Cs of about less than 6.5, the blue line at the bottom, everything's looking very good. The light blue line, 6.5 to 7, you start to see greater prandial excursions. 
the green line, seven to eight, now you've got a huge amount of granular exclusions, but you've still got a fasting level that's not too bad. So you start to get eight, nine, over nine, now your fasting is up and your postprandials are higher. And so when you measure control, when you look at hemoglobin A1C, higher hemoglobin A1Cs are associated not only with a higher fasting, but they're associated with higher postprandials. And this is a classic, classic study by Monnier, basically showing you that the contribution to hemoglobin A1C is different at different levels of hemoglobin A1C. At less than seven, your about 30% is fasting, about 70% is based on your glucose excursions. On the other hand, at 10%, 70% of the contribution comes from fasting, only 30% from postprandials. And beta cells die in a very orderly fashion. As beta cells start to malfunction, the first thing that happens is you lose the first phase of insulin secretion. And therefore, you lose that crucial ability to block hepatic glucose output immediately on eating. Then there's a progressive, initially there's an increase in second phase. That's why some people have reactive hypoglycemia. But then there's a progressive loss of that second phase, and that's what further deteriorates control. And so here you see that the diminished first phase is clearly associated with elevated postprandial glucose, and this is clearly defined in terms of the response at 30 minutes and the two-hour plasma glucose. I think it's very important to understand that that first loss of first phase is much more crucial than we've ever thought. Remember also that insulin regulates the alpha cell. Insulin and uh, something else is produced by the beta cell called amylin suppresses beta uh, alpha cell function, suppresses glucagon. So as you don't produce insulin appropriately, you keep producing glucagon inappropriately. And therefore, the two of them work in concert to allow for hepatic glucose output to be increased. And you see here that in fact, in people with diabetes, or in people where the glucagon is not suppressed, you get far more glucose coming out of the liver than in people where the glucagon is suppressed. So. When you think about a fasting group sugar level in someone with diabetes, what are the conditions that raise that fasting sugar level? Well, the higher morning levels of counter-regulatory hormones, cortisol, growth hormone, adrenaline, they all rise in the morning. Why do they rise? Because they are the ones that activate our reticular activating system, and that's why most of us, like an old man like me who always wakes up at 5 o'clock, it doesn't matter whether it's a Sunday or a holiday, I'll wake up at 5 o'clock because that's what my internal hormones have said. Those hormones oppose the action of insulin. So if I don't, can't produce a lot of insulin at that time and those hormones go up, my fasting sugar will go up. Also, what is the most powerful physiologic diuretic that we've got? Well, what do we do with people in heart failure? What do we do people with preeclampsia? We put them on bed rest, why? Because the moment you lie down flat, you increase your GFR by 40%. But if you increase your GFR, you're going to create the insulin that much faster. Okay. Also, if there is not enough endogenous glucose, this ins the beta cell doesn't want to produce as much insulin. So you're deficient in insulin more so overnight. And obviously, it's the liver that functions. And if you have a lot of insulin resistance to the liver, you're going to end up becoming a high, a having a high hepatic glucose output. So those are the four major drivers for, uh, for um, uh, hi fasting hypoglycemia. These are the insulins that are presently available. And notice that you've got the short-acting analogs, lispro, aspart, glulysin, inhaled insulin if it ever comes out again. They have very rapid peaks. Regular insulin? You know, if you were to think about beta cell function and try and correlate it with this insulin, then the short-acting analogs would be almost, not completely exact, but almost like the first phase of insulin secretion, or a combination of the first phase and the second phase. Regular insulin is pure second phase. There is no first phase effect. And that's why you get higher prandials with regular insulin than you'll get with uh, Lyspro or, or any of the short acting analogs. NPH is an intermediate insulin, but it has peak activity, which means that it doesn't know what it wants to do. Does it want to just block hepatic glucose output, or does it also want to cause uh, muscle glucose disposal? So it's a difficult insulin to work with. It calls, tends to have a higher incidence of hypoglycemia. Detomer has much less of a peak effect, is probably more flat, and certainly glargine also has a little bit of peak effect, but is basically uh, f uh, flat in most individuals. So you've got patients where you want to initiate insulin, 
According to the global guidelines for type 2 diabetes by the IDF, there is no question insulin is the most effective way of reducing hypoglycemia. It can be started as a basal insulin alone, or it can start with premix insulin. As an endocrinologist living in the United States, I think premix insulins are the worst things since sliced bread. I think they're horrible because they take away the ability of the patient to self-manage. But that's my personal feelings. When the glucose control is not adequate, you need to start basal insulin. And that case that I presented, once she starts to fail two or three agents, the best thing is, in fact, to start basal insulin. And you really want to start low and titrate. So what is the problem with insulins? Well, obviously, you don't want a peak insulin. Because if you've got a peak, uh, insulin that has a peak, it will cause muscle glucose disposal. It will tend to predispose to hypoglycemia. The lower the peak, the less the chances are that you're going to be able to dispose glucose off in muscle. Because disposing glucose off means you're depleting glucose in the blood, causing hypoglycemia. So I think from that point of view, the old insulins did tend to give us this problem. The problem, the other problem with the old insulins was they had a variable absorption in the same person from day to day. Pronounced peaks we've talked about and obviously did not last 24 hours. Because of this, it caused unpredictable hypoglycemia and there was very little ability to use them appropriately because if you use a short acting on top of the long acting, you could get stacking. Uh, pre premix, you problem with premix, among other things, is if you adjust one insulin, you adjust a whole lot and it becomes very difficult to work with. The ideal basal insulin would mimic normal basal pancreatic secretion, a little bit every nine minutes or a flat line. It's long lasting around 24 hours, smooth, peakless profile. It's reproducible and has predictable effects, reduces the risk of nocturnal hypoglycemia, and it's convenient by once daily. Obviously, with the, advanta with the advan advance of pens, this becomes very easy to do. And I think we've sort of got to the point where we should think about it. What about short-acting insulins? Well, the regular-acting and short-acting analogs, if for regular, you have to understand the dose decides how long it's going to work, how much it's going to work, and when it is going to work after you inject it. So the bigger the dose, the further the peak, the greater the duration, and the greater the effect. With the analogs, you never have to worry about increasing duration. It doesn't matter how much of the analogs take. You can rarely, rarely increase the duration beyond two and a half to three hours. You will certainly increase the peak, and the peak will occur very quickly after you inject it. So you're tending to get closer to the first phase of insulin secretion. Okay? The differences between NPH and basal analogs are basically the day-to-day -day variability, the duration. NPH cannot last 24 hours. Uh, both uh, glargine and detamer class close to 24 hours, uh, detamer being a little less than the glargine, but both of them, depending on dose, can get up to 24 hours. So that, in fact, glargine at about 15 units usually goes for more than, uh, almost 24 hours. It takes about 25 units or 30 units of detamer to get to a 24-hour profile. This is the variability I'm talking about. In the top is the brown in NPH. Notice, three days in a row, there was a completely different profile in each of these three individuals. With glargine, it was significantly attenuated. And with detamer, there was almost no variability day to day to day. And so that's what we're talking about when we talk about variability. So let's go back. So I've got a patient I need to start insulin on. How am I going to think about when to do and how to do it? So the, when you look at self-blood glucose monitoring, it tells you everything you want to know about this patient. So here are three basic profiles. Profile one, the fasting sugar is higher than the sugar at supper. So she wakes up in the morning, she's 240, but by supper time she's down to about 160. What's the pathophysiology? Pathophysiology is overnight, when she's not eating, she is not able to produce enough insulin to maintain control of the uh, liver. She basically is therefore unable to control hepatic glucose output. Her fasting goes up. However, the moment she eats, the beta cell has enough ability to produce the insulin, and therefore sugars keep falling through the day while she's eating. What she needs is a nighttime insulin to control hep hepatic glucose output. 
and therefore you would use a basal insulin starting at the night. Second profile, her supper sugar is higher than a fasting sugar. This is the exact opposite. Her beta cell, when it is not stressed, produces enough insulin to try and maintain hepatic glucose output. But the moment she eats, she is unable to produce enough insulin to overcome or take care of the meal. She needs help during the day. The ideal would be to give her a short-acting insulin at each meal. Most of my patients don't like that, even though that is the ideal. So what I do is I'd probably give her a basal starting in the morning and then see what happens to her meals. In this circumstance, you are at risk for over-basalization. So you need to keep that in mind when you think about using basal insulin to control this person. The third profile, hell, he's just, this person's just off. Both the fasting and the supper sugars are all high, they continue. This person truly has a global insulinopenia. And they basically, ideal would be multiple dose of insulin, with my basal insulin once a day and prandial insulin with each meal. Practically what you do is you start with a basal at bedtime and after the fasting sugar is at goal, you look at the rest of the profile and then you add prandials depending on the profile. So for example, you start someone with a basal insulin at bedtime, and you target the basal insulin so that their fasting sugar gets down to around 120 or 140. If their fasting sugar is 120 or 140, and their sugar before lunch starts to go up to 160, their sugar before supper starts to go up to 180, the sugar at bedtime goes up to 200, you know that this person needs help with each of the prandials. And so therefore you might very well say, okay, I'm going to start you on prandials, or you can be slow and you can say, which is your biggest meal? I'll start you with your biggest meal and then slowly transition. In a study that was done, 88% of the people ended up on three shots at some point in time or not. So it's, some, it's, a, it's the old question. Do you want me to remove your Band-Aid with one scream or a series of short screams? And basically that's the way you work it. It's important to remember that you cannot over-basalize. You cannot say, I started basal insulin I haven't got control at supper time, but I've got control at breakfast time. I'll just keep ratcheting up the basal because it's only one shot. It doesn't work. It induces hypoglycemia. It induces poor control because the peaks, as you can see in this graph, are still way over the threshold of insulin action. Okay. So the basal based concept is the basal protects you from between meals and overnight in terms of hepatic glucose output. It's usually about 40 to 50 percent of daily insulin needs. Prandial or the bolus insulin always limits hyperglycemia after meals. Its immediate rise and sharp peak at one hour tends to put the postprandial down. It's about 10 to 20 percent of total daily insulin requirement at each meal. So when you think about it, what you want to do is you want to try and get this, uh, this process more in the top uh, graph than in the bottom graph because you don't want to over basalize if you can. So that's the 50-50 rule. So how do you decide on how to start insulin? Well, my personal preference is to look at an individual patient, look at their weight in kilograms. I'm going to give them 0.5 units per kilogram per day. So I take the weight in kilograms, that's their 100 kilograms. I know they will require 50 units of insulin. I've said that half of that should be basal. So if I'm going to start a basal insulin first, all I'm going to do is go ahead and give 25 units of basal insulin. Now, if you look at the, PR, at the uh, product information, product information starts, say, start at 10 units and then slowly work up. You can if you want to, but remember, that product information is written with liability in mind. And you too have some liability, but you've got to start at a level that's going to give you some benefit. Not only because you need it, but because psychologically the patient needs it. Starting people on 10 units of insulin usually doesn't give them much of an effect. I think it's important to start at a reasonable level. You might not want to use 25, you might want to start 15 or 18 or 20, that's up to you. But you need to person place where you want to start. The duration, the, the efficacy of a basal insulin is eight hours later. So if you start a basal insulin at bedtime, the efficacy is measured by the morning sugar. The duration is measured by the sugar at supper time. So, if you get someone whose fasting sugar has dropped to 120 and their supper time sugar is 200, they either aren't getting enough prandials or they have 
to have a split dose of the basal. It's as simple as that. You cannot extend by increasing the dose of basal. You will get a low in the morning, and you still won't get control. So you decide on the efficacy at eight hours and the duration at 20 hours. That's how you work with basal insulins, and you decide how to change basal insulins. So the basal regimen is usually driven by algorithms. Once daily, you use it. I told you about how much you want to start it off at, and I told you how I do it, and you target it at about 70 to 130. If at that time the hemoglobin A1C still remains elevated, you still haven't got control, then you look at the pre-breakfast, pre-lunch, and pre-supper, and then you add prandial insulins accordingly. And as I said, you can start by doing it all at once, or you can say, this is your biggest meal, we'll start with your biggest meal, and then we'll go to your second biggest meal, and then we'll go to your third biggest meal, and see how that's done. The idea is to get control. It is very, 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 very important. When you start a basal insulin, either in your own mind or preferably on the, on the paper that you write, your documentation, you tell me what you think is going to control the prandials. So if you tell me you're going to start someone on metformin and a basal insulin, what are you telling me? You're telling me that you truly believe that this person's endogenous beta cells, if they don't have to work basally, will be able to produce enough insulin to look after the meal. If you'd start someone on something like uh, a DPP-4 or a sulfonylurea plus metformin plus a basal insulin, what are you telling me? You're telling me, I'm going to give you the basal insulin, and I'm anticipating that the secretagogue, whether it's the DPP-4 or the sulfonylurea, is going to allow you to control prandials. If you, if you are telling me that if you write that this person is insulinopenic, you're not giving them any reason to improve their prandial response, then you're doing something wrong. So I think it's very important that you decide where is the pathophysiology in the person. If the person, if you believe the person has enough ability to produce prandials when, when, when stimulated to do so by DPP-4 or GLP-1 or, or sulfonylurea, then you can use a basal alone. If you believe the beta cell can do it alone, that's fair. You can use basal insulin with metformin. But you always have to answer the question in your own mind, what's going to look after the prandial? I think it's very important to realize insulins have different effects. Here, look at this particular uh, effect in terms of myocardial blood flow. And look at, in controls, you eat postprandially, your myocardial blood flow improves. People with diabetes are nothing. The myocardial blood flow is decreased. People taking a regular insulin, that delayed peak is one of the factors. The myocardial blood flow is decreased. You use an analog, that immediate rise in, in insulin, the ability to stop prandial glucose excursion. The myocardial blood flow behaves as if it was normal. Go back to that process of first phase. Go back to the process that the analogs gives you the ability to at least mimic part of the first phase, and you improve blood flow. It's not only sugar. You're changing vascular function. So this is what uh, people who, have, who are normal. In blue, it's people with normal. Lots of basal, a little bit of prandial. People with type 2 diabetes, the basal is higher, and the prandial is higher. Mealtime glucose is uh, higher. If you use only basal, you control the, uh, the basal amount, but your prandial excursions remain high. If you over-basalize, you find that there's a huge, or, or if you use just prandial control, you find that you can control prandial, but you can't control glucose. To control both, you need to do both. What is the biggest side effect of insulin? Hypoglycemia. If you look at UKPDS, this is the stylized UKPDS. As your hemoglobin A1C goes up, your chance of retinopathy increases. And so we've said, you've got to control your hemoglobin A1C. That's how you're going to stop micro, microvascular complications. What we forgot was hypoglycemia is exactly the opposite. As your hemoglobin A1C goes down, your incidence of hypoglycemia increases. And while this is a stylized figure, if you actually look at the UKPDS data, the point where acceptable hypoglycemia and acceptable control wasn't 7%. It was actually about 7.5 to 
But 7% seems to be the practical best in terms of being able to stop complications. So I think it's important to remember that hypoglycemia is a huge problem. In the UK PDS, the incidence of hypoglycemia was lower than in DCCT. DCCT was type 1. They are more liable to hypoglycemia than type 2. But the type 2 is liable to hypoglycemia. And so therefore, you have to be aware of that. Why should we be aware of that? What happened in Accord? In Accord, we were going to push people down to 6.5%. In those people whom we were trying to push to 6.5%, we didn't achieve that. But because of our excessive trials, there seemed to be an increased incidence of sudden death. And in the people who died, there was a higher incidence of hypoglycemia. I am not saying that hypoglycemia caused the death. It was an association. In fact, it was not even an association to hemoglobin A1c. The people couldn't achieve the hemoglobin A1c we were doing. That's why we were pushing them so hard. And yet, they were the ones who got into trouble. So I think it's important to understand that you get predisposed individuals. You try for tight control, especially with insulin you do run into that risk. So I think it's important to always keep hypoglycemia in the front part of your mind. When you compare the anal basal analogs, here Detamer versus NPH, a significant decrease in the incidence of uh, hypoglycemia uh, nocturnal or alternatively throughout the day. Just to be sh sure, the glargine also shows the same lower level of hypoglycemia. Because it's a peakless insulin, you tend to get away with much less. And when you compare glargine and detamer, there seems to be a bit of a, a potential benefit of detamer or glargine, but it's still better than NPH. I just talked about the Accord trial. I've told you that this was, in fact, an association that we have to pay attention to. Unfortunately, we may have gone overboard, because there are some people writing papers saying, Oh, in someone who's got significant cardiac disease and significant comorbidities, you don't want the hemoglobin A1C much less than 8.5%. That is not correct. You do want some control of hemoglobin A1C. You may not want it below 7%, but you do want it somewhere between 7.5, maybe 8% to try and get them to at least protect, protect them. What is the second effect of insulin? Weight gain. Insulin is the most powerful depositor of weight, partly because of good control, partly because you're not feeding your toilet, and your toilet is not putting on weight. It has anabolic effects. It does make you increase fat storage. It decreases your metabolism metabolic rate. And obviously, it makes you feel hungry. It doesn't matter what your sugar is. Insulin turns on the brain to make you feel hungry. So therefore, you will tend to eat a little more. And we look, we look, we look at with basal insulins, there seems to be a little less ability to continue to make fat. So you compare glargine with his NPH in the Riddell study, uh, Detamer against NPH in the Hermanson study, and the Phyllis uh, Simaka study, again, Detamer against NPH, and you find less weight gain with the analogs. And I think that's important to keep in mind. So what are the take-home points of this presentation? Type 2 diabetes occurs because the beta cell cannot compensate for insulin resistance. Beta cell dysfunction is progressive. Insulin then becomes the only utilizable agent when you don't have beta cells. If you don't have horses, if your horses are dead, it doesn't matter how many whips you got, you ain't getting no speed. Insulin therapy needs to mimic normal physiology. And basically, insulin has two functions. Control hepatic glucose output, that's your basal. Dispose of an ingested glucose load, that's your prandial. The analog insulins have facilitated optimal glucose patterns and have relatively limited, but not zero, side effects of weight gain and hypoglycemia. So I think I'm going to stop there, and thank you very much for your attention. I appreciate the fact that you've given me your time, and I hope that I have been of some help. Thank you.